We're in this series called Fearless, where we are looking at the life of Daniel and three of his friends. Um, Daniel was a prisoner. He was actually a POW, all right, uh, one of the first recorded prisoners of war. And uh, I believe that Daniel is someone who not only we could learn historically from, but as followers of God, as children of God, if we emulate the life that he lived and the faith that we have when life hits us with things. Has anybody ever been hit by life before? Come on, just raise your hands just so the people next to you can feel like, all right, I'm in this, we're in it together. Um, when I was in 10th grade, I was an assistant like youth leader in my church. We had about five, 600 youth. This was a huge church huge youth group and the youth group was so big that the youth pastor looked for high schoolers that uh, could teach the middle schoolers and so he picked me as one of the teachers to the middle schoolers so that's when I started getting my preaching chops I was like 15 years old and then uh, 11th grade uh, no 10th grade ends and now we're at summer camp and I'm preaching one of the sessions, right? They gave me, I was super excited. I got the opportunity to preach one of the ses sessions and it was just with boys, right? And it could be kind of rowdy. You ever been in a room, you're talking and people are kind of talking to you from the audience and um, that's cool sometimes, right? So this was one of those times and I'm preaching and, and I'm telling the young kids like, you guys have to have faith. You gotta have faith, right? I was like, you gotta have faith and, and, and you guys gotta stand for God. Like, like don't be like posers. Like, like, don't say you love God and then when temptation comes, like, you walk away, right? And, and so I'm saying this whole message and then one of the kids stands up in the middle of the message. So think about that. So now we have Officer Martinez here. If any of you stand up and start screaming at me, he's gonna tase you or something. Maybe not, but... Um, so uh, the guy uh, starts saying, you don't know what it's like. And I was shocked because I was not used to someone standing in the middle of a sermon and yelling at me, right? And, and, uh, and I'm like, dude, sit down. He goes, you don't know what it's like. You're a pretty boy that goes to private school and you don't know what it's like. And it's true, my entire life up to that point, 10th grade, I've been in private school and Christian school. It's real. It's easier, not real easy, but it's easier to be a Christian when you go to Christian school, right? And, um, and I, I lost track. Like, I forgot where my notes were. And I am like, uh, uh, uh. And the only thing that I could say, I respond to him, I'm going to prove it to you. Next year, I'm going to go to public school. I hadn't talked to my mom, my dad, nothing. I was already enrolled to go 11th grade to private school again. And I said, you know what? I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to go to public school next year, and I'm going to stand for God, and I'm going to be a Christian, and we're going to go to church together, and you're going to see what it's like, right? And I did it. I, I enrolled in HML. I went to HML, and, and let me tell you, it was some of the most loneliest moments of my teenage life was being in this school and feeling like a complete outsider, and also not just because I was a Christian, but could you imagine 11th grade? Most of the kids have been together since elementary school or middle school. So I was like the outsider. And then on top of that, I didn't go to any of their crazy parties. I didn't skip school with them. I didn't, you know, cuss. I didn't do any of this crazy stuff. And they're like, hey, this girl likes you. And I'm like, no, I don't want to hang out with that girl. You know, so I was like this oddball. And one day it was lunch, right? And I had a car and at the time you could actually go out to lunch, but I was just out of place, you know, and I was standing up for my beliefs. I was being a Christian. And whenever the opportunity came, I would share my faith. I would go to the Bible club, which was at like six o'clock in the morning. Like, oh, it was like me and two other nerds. Right. And um, so I'm in, uh, you know, I'm there and, and, and I'm like just sitting in a corner, like bummed out. And this person comes up to me and says, hey, aren't you Mark? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm friends with some of your friends and I'm a Christian. And I think, why don't we start hanging out? You know, why don't we go to lunch together and, and why don't we try to find other Christians and, and that way we could like have a group and, 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 and not be alone because they were going through the same thing that, that I was going through. You know, I, I thought I was alone. And first of all, God was with me. Sometimes we think we're alone, but, but God's with us even when there's no one there. But I, at that moment, I just felt like I'm standing up for God. I'm doing what God's asking me to do. I'm in this school. 
I don't really have any friends because honestly, I was scared because like of everything, you know, you're going to public school, they're going to like inject you with drugs and you're going to get AIDS. Like as soon as you walk through the door, like it was all this crazy, you know, just taboo, crazy stuff, you know, and um, I would go have lunch at my grandma's house every day. Like think about that, like super geek, right? And um, it was great food, but, but my friends thought I was there. Hey, what are you doing for lunch? I'm going to my grandma's house. I'm like. And I, I felt alone. Has anybody ever felt alone? You know, loneliness, abandonment is probably some of the worst feelings that you can ever have, especially when you make a decision to do something that's right. Especially when you're like, you know what, I'm going to stand up for God, and now I stand up for God, and I'm at work, and I'm alienated. I stand up for God, and I hang out with my family, and my family makes me feel bad because I don't do what I, what I used to do before. And that's what we're, we're going to talk about today. In a message that I've titled, Always Stand for God, regardless of what's happening in your life. You see, God wants to bless us. And I, I taught you a couple weeks ago, and it was in the YouTube video that we put out last week. And, and it's before the blessing comes, there's a time of testing. All right, before God can bless you, there's a time where he tests us to make sure that we can handle the blessings that he wants to give us. And sometimes before we can have success, there's a period of stress Right? There's a period of trial. Like right now in this building, the reason that we're here and not up there is because there's a bunch of teenagers like fighting to be number one in this basketball division that they're all in. Right? And the only way to win the championship today, it's today. They're going to win the championship is if they've trained, is if they've, they've gone through stress, is if they've, they've gone through difficulty. And then what happens? Then one team ends up winning. See, our life can be like that sometimes. We have stress. We have difficulty. There's moments in our life that we want to give up. Right now, any of those kids can give up and say, forget it. I'm out of here. I'd rather go play NBA on my uh, video game system than to be playing on, up on this court. And they could quit. We could quit today. We could say, you know what? I'm tired of this God thing. I'm tired of being a husband. I'm tired of being a dad. And we could bail out. And we all know stories of people that do that. Parents that abandon their kids. Wives, husbands that leave their families. But you know what? When we pass the test, then God blesses us. And today God wants to know, are you blessable? God's asking you, can I bless you? Can I give you these things that I talk about in the Bible, these, these blessings that are just going to fill your life? And so today we're going to look at the life of three POWs, these Jewish boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All right, they're Daniel's best friends. Fifteen years have passed. They've been captive they've been prisoners remember that they were going through this test to become like these magicians and philosophers and teachers and so they've passed these tests these guys are now governors they're like mayors in babylon they're rulers they have status okay and king nebuchadnezzar he's the guy that's in charge of babylon the largest empire in the world the most powerful man in the world all right and you know what happens when someone gets a lot of power when they get a lot of money when they get a lot of influence, what's like the next thing that follows is what? It's ego. It's pride. And this king was so proud. He has such a big ego. And that's where we jump in the scripture today. Daniel chapter 3. It says that King Nebuchadnezzar made a giant gold image of himself. 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And then he gives this order to all his officials, to the princes, to the prefects, to the governors and advisors and the treasurers and the judges and the magistrates and all their officials to come to the official dedication of this statue that he had set up. When they had all assembled, the announcer shouted out, people of all races and nations and languages, this is the king's command. Anytime you hear the royal orchestra start playing music, you're all to immediately drop everything, fall to your knees and bow down and worship the image of King Nebuchadnezzar. Drop everything. How inconvenient. Like, you know, you're working or maybe you got your groceries. Now you hear the music and boom, drop. Fall on your knees and worship the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't enough to be king. Now he wanted to be a god. He's saying, I want everyone to worship me. You see, that's the oldest temptation ever. Wanting people to, to worship you, to revere you. The Bible says that Adam and Eve were told by Satan that you will be gods if you do what I tell you to do. And then 
It continues here in Daniel chapter 3. Anyone who does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a giant blazing furnace. As soon as they heard the music, everybody bowed down before the statue and worshiped the image of the king. See, before we go any further, I know for some of us, man, that's just silly, right? That's just silly. Like, that would be, and, and some would probably say that, that seems reasonable or it may happen. That's like if, like if Donald Trump set up like a 90-foot gold statue of himself and whenever the band played, you bowed down and worship. He probably wouldn't be against that. Maybe he would, but, but um, you know, it sounds silly. We, we, we wouldn't think that that would even happen, right? But you know what? That was 2,500 years ago. That is so relevant in our culture today because our culture suffers from this very same thing. You see, the world creates larger than life images for us to worship. The world, the media, our culture. And maybe there's not 90 foot statues anywhere that people are actually bowing down and, and worshiping here in our country, in our city, in our state. But they're up on movie screens. They're actors, athletes, superstars. I mean, Derek Jeter, like one of the most famous baseball, best baseball players of our time, whether you like the Yankees or not, you can't take that away from him. Stands a couple feet from us, you know, depressed most nights, right? <laughs> Concerts. When was the last time you went to a concert? If that doesn't seem like some type of idolatry worship i mean they come out of the ground there's lights and smokes i love going to concerts i'm a musician i love it but but this world worships idols people right then there's the internet and, and social media that makes people larger than life and by the way people still worship gold people still worship money you see but today's statues today's idols they're not necessarily like a sculpture all right a lot of people, they worship physical beauty, right? It's if you're not beautiful, if you don't have what it looks, the looks, the pecs, you know, the, the fake implants or whatever it may be, you know, if that's where you get your identity and you don't have that, the world says you're not good enough, right? And, and God is looking at all of us today and he's saying, I love you and you're beautiful. Even if someone's told you that you're not good enough, even if you tell yourself you're not good enough, God is looking at you. He says, you are perfect. The Bible tells us that God created us in the palm of his hand. Think about like last time you held something precious in the palm of your hand and, and you took care of it. Maybe it's your child. Maybe it's an heirloom that you had. It's like, oh my God created us tenderly in the palm of his hands. That means that we are precious in his sight. But the world worships that. The world worships beauty, physical beauty. And so we're tempted to think if, if I don't look a certain way that, that I'm not good enough. I saw the craziest documentary last night. Couldn't sleep much. And, and, and I put on Netflix. And there's this whole crazy thing about like counterfeit makeup and this YouTube craze. The number one thing that people watch on YouTube, you may know this. I just found out is like how to put on makeup, right? And all these kids that can't afford like... The real expensive makeup are buying counterfeit makeup with the same name and, and they're putting like crazy glue on their lips. There was this girl that crazy glued her lips together, right? And then what's crazy is when the camera zooms out, like they're a total mess. But like right here, like what you see on TV, they're beautiful. They're, you know, this fake thing. And, and that's the power that the world has on us. The second thing is that we're tempted to create false images of ourselves to impress others. Does that sound pretty relevant? We're tempted to create false images of ourselves to impress other people. And the truth is, like, like when we share certain things about ourselves that isn't who we really are, this false impression of who we are, what we really want is people to worship us. I mean, to like us, literally, right? How many likes did you get? Anytime that we spend building up our own image, is potentially a trap for us to begin worshiping ourselves. Man, that, that's tough. I mean, even as I was preparing for this message, I'm like, man, is, are there things in my life that I need to adjust and tweak? Am I trying to build my image? Ask yourself that question. What's the image that you're trying to build up and for what? Because, hey, you know what? It's not bad to look good. It's not bad to be presentable, to do good things for God's glory and to give God glory. And because you're a child of God, if your life is in order and life is good and it's happy, then it's good. But if it's not real, if it's fake, and if it's to just bring you glory and to make you feel good, then I think that we're kind of struggling with the same thing that, that Nebuchadnezzar struggled with. You know, 
How do we know when someone idolizes themselves? They think that the world revolves around them. Think about it. I'm sure you know people like that. You think the world revolves around me. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's the person sitting next to you and do not look at them, please. Like, you know, keep it cool, right? Everything has to go with my schedule and what I want. And when it's convenient for me, that's someone who idolizes himself. That says, I'm more important, and because I'm more important, and I make the most money, or I have the most influence, or because I'm the man, then everything has to revolve around me. So we don't have golden idols. We just make ourselves idols by what we post online, what we post on social media. Everybody come and worship me. The third thing is, if I reject the world's images and idols, people will try to burn me. Think about that. If you tell people, hey, you know what, I'm not going to do that. How many times does that happen? I'm not going to live this way. I'm not going to talk this way. I'm not going to look this way. I'm not going to approve this lifestyle. What does the world do to us? You're a bigot. Oh, you, you're intolerant. You're a horrible person. How can you say that? How can you look like that? And see, I, I'm not talking that now we're going to be arrogant and rude and mean to people. But sometimes if we don't worship what the world is calling us to worship as, as Christians, it's, it's difficult. And what do we do? Do we just go with the flow? Right? That's not what, what these young men did. See, in Daniel chapter 3, verse 8, it says, But some Babylonian officials used this opportunity to denounce the Jews. They told the king, Oh, great king, we hope you live forever. What kiss-ups, right? Oh, great king, great king, we hope you live forever. Sounds like a lot of like work environments. You walk up to the boss, oh, you're so awesome, ha, ha, ha. Laughing at all the corny jokes that they say just so that we can get in with them. The Jewish official that you put in charge of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they have defied your decree, they have refused to serve your gods, and they have refused to bow down and worship your image that you set up. They should be burned in a blazing furnace. See, the same way that they try to burn these guys, people trying to burn you. People, people try to burn us when we don't do what they want us to do, when we don't live the way that they want us to live, when we don't believe what other people believe. Hey, we could be as loving as we can, and yet it's still not enough. You see, because doing the right thing always makes some people angry. When we do the right thing, when we live life the right way, it always makes someone angry. And that's what was happening. These guys were being, being followers of God. And hey, you know what? They changed their name. We learned about that. They learned their language. And yet they said, you know what? We're not going to worship you. We're not going to bow down before you. All right? And, and you're probably wondering, where's Daniel? Did Daniel bow down? I remember as a kid. Has anybody thought, where's Daniel? Shadrach, Mishan, Abednego, did Daniel bow down? Well, Daniel was like number two to the king. So Daniel probably wasn't there. All right, that's what theologians believe. Daniel was probably like in another part, far away, taking care of business. But believe me, Daniel would have not bowed down either. All right. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful person, he got upset. Have you ever not done what someone wanted you to do, a powerful person? And they just get like completely like they lose their cool, right? They go completely crazy. And, and that's what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible says that his face changed when he heard that they defied him. You see, and in life, we're there's three different kinds of people, all right? There's stuck-up people, right? You know stuck-up people? There's kiss-up people, right? And there's other ways of saying kiss something else, right? There's people that like to do that stuff, right? And then there's people that stand up. So Nebuchadnezzar stuck up, right? Worship me. Come, the world revolves around me. Then you got the bureaucrats. They're kissing up to him because they're trying to get status. They're trying to, to move up in rank. And so they're like, if we get rid of these three guys, maybe they'll put us where they are. But then we got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these are stand up people. These are the people you want to be friends with. These are the people you want to become. Young people, that's who you want to marry. A stand up person, someone with integrity. Someone who won't compromise what they believe in. Someone who won't talk behind your back. Someone who won't lie about you. Someone that will love you and care about you. And so my question to us today is, who are we? Who are we in school? Are we stand-up people? Or are we kiss-up people? Are we stuck-up people? Who are we at work? Who are we in our neighborhood or when we're hanging out with our friends? 
Are we just trying to flatter everyone and make everyone happy and be the, the you know, when we were in school, the class clown or just the party animal, the person that everyone wants to be around, but we're compromising all of our beliefs, everything that we know in our core that God would not want us to do. You know why these guys didn't bow down? Because they knew the word of God. That's why it's so important for us to be reading God's word, to be coming to church, to be praying for us to sign up for this 21 day prayer and fast. If you haven't signed up, do it today because I believe that all of our lives are gonna change. The reason they didn't do it is because they knew the word of God and they knew the first two commandments, all right? First two commandments, had it memorized. All right, Jewish boys by the age of five had the first five books of the Bible memorized. Books, not chapters, not verses, books memorized. And they knew that they could not break the Lord's commandments. They knew that you shall have no other gods before me. They knew that they can't worship another God. You're probably thinking, Mark, I got that covered, Mark. I, I'm, I don't worship any other gods. Jesus is my God. I got my cross. You know, I, I pray to my cross and I pray to Jesus. And, and Jesus is the only one in my life. But you know what? Whatever has first place in your life, whatever has first place in your life is your God. Your business can be your God. Your spouse can be your God. Your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your children, oh my gosh. Our children, they could be our gods. We can put our kids before God. We can put our kids sometimes wrongfully before our spouse and, and, and God than our spouse, right? If, if, if our kids take up all of our time and that's how you identify a God, it's what is taking up all of your mental space and your physical space. And if it is anything else that is not God, that person is who you are worshiped. Some people making money is their God. Think about that. How many people do we know that making money is their God? Is there anything wrong with making money? Absolutely not. Is there anything wrong with being a great parent and a great business person and a great husband, a great wife? No, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with these things, but nothing deserves first place in our life. Amen? Can I get an amen? Nothing deserves first place in our life. And so think about that. What is that thing? Sometimes it's an addiction. And you put your entire family, your future, your career because of a thing. You may say God is my God, but whatever you think about the most, whatever you love the most is your God. And you know what happens is that we begin to look like our God. Think about that. If you worship sports, think about people. There's people that worship sports. Is this crazy or not? And if you look at someone who all their life revolves around is football and the tailgate, what happens? It's like they look like you know, like I know what's the most important thing in your life. If it's someone that worships money, right? All they talk about, all they want to do is show you their gold, their jewelry, their car, everything. That's the most important thing in my life. People that worship their kids. Oh my God, because I go to Berlin, I go to Berlin, and it's like, or, oh, you know, it's not just women, it's men too. You know, and all they talk about. And then think about this. Someone who God is number one in their life. What do they talk about? What do they do? How do they act? And the reason that we do these things is because we were created to worship. We were created perfectly to worship God. So in our hearts, there is the desire, not just the desire, the instinct to worship something, anything. It's okay. You don't need to worry about fixing it. You can let it stay on the floor. Um, that's why it's so easy for us. That's why we see kids, Cuban kids. You know what Cuban kids worship? El tete, right? El tete. They don't say mommy. They don't say papi. They say tete. Ocheche, right? That's what they worship. It's, it comes naturally from us. And so in these 21 days, as we prepare to fast, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit tomorrow in the devotional that you guys are going to get, but what is that thing? Think about anything in your life that is occupying the space that God deserves in your life. Let's keep reading. Daniel chapter 3, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage. He ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought to him. The king asked him, is it true that the three of you refuse to serve my gods or worship the statue that I set up? 
I'll give you one more chance. He's giving them a chance. He's a nice guy, right? If you bow down and worship the statue, all will be well. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And then what, what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Here he's saying, I'm bigger than your God. You know, sometimes, practically, it could be at work. Maybe at work you've been asked to do something that's, that's not right. Maybe you've been asked to do something that goes against your faith. And your boss finds out, say, I heard you're not doing your job. So I need you to do your job. And what do we do in that moment? Because you know what we start thinking is, oh, my God, my bills. God knows my heart. How many times have we sinned or done something dumb and said, I did that, but God knows my heart. I know I'm living in sin, but God knows my heart. God knows that I love him, right? And he's cool with me. Like, he lets me do all this crazy stuff and, and live this way, but, but God's cool with me. And you know what? I grew up in a church where it said you're going to hell. I don't think you're going to hell, but life is going to be like hell, right? I don't think you're going to burn forever because you sin. You're just robbing yourselves from the incredible blessings that God can give you. Because all Christians, we all sin, right? You give your life to Christ and you're struggling with a sin and, and man, life is going to be pretty bad for you, all right? And Jesus loves you and you can't blame Jesus for the bad things that are going on in your life because these are decisions that you're making that pull you away from God. And so Nebuchadnezzar asked them the same question that the world asks us, that our friends ask us. When we go hang out with them, we go to the party and we're like, I'm just going to dance, bro. I'm just going to dance. But then the time comes to do something else that ain't dancing and you don't have the courage or you're too weak to make the right decision. And so your friends turn into Nebuchadnezzar and say, what are you going to do now? You're not going to take the hit. You're not going to take drink this drink. You're not going to go talk to that girl. It's just talking, bro. It's not, you're, you're, you know, you could talk, right? That's what the world does to us. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar is doing to them. So what are you going to do when you're pressured to conform? What are we going to do as followers of Jesus? You know what? When you do the right thing, don't worry about defending yourself. Don't worry about defending. A lot of Christians waste so much time fighting and trying to defend themselves. Trying to defend God. And you know what? Just quietly trust God to take care of your attackers. Look what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. This isn't just me preaching. This is what they did. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves in this matter. By the way, they implied here that God doesn't need to defend himself either. Don't worry when people attack you. The second thing is that remember that God has the power to save you. Whatever you're going through right now, God has the power to save you. And if it's going to cost you your job, it's because God has something better for you. Think about that. People that decide not to obey God or maybe not to be as loyal or have integrity in their business practices, and then they're wondering why they're always struggling. And could it be because God's given you an opportunity to stand up for him, get fired so he can give you a better job? Right? Maybe you've been dating a guy and he's pushing you to do things you know you shouldn't do or a girl pushing you to do something you shouldn't do and you know you're not happy, but oh my God, I don't want to be alone. And God could have that person that you've been praying for your entire life ready to sweep you off your feet and you don't walk into the blessings of God because you're not willing to stand up for God. That is the most practical and easy thing that, that any of us could ever think of, Right? But so many times we don't even realize and it's right there before our eyes that God's blessing is ready, willing and able for you to take hold of it. And we don't take hold of it because we don't do what Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego did. Remember that God has the power to save you. Look at what the young men tell Nebuchadnezzar. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God that we worship is able to save us. Man, that's quite a statement. We know that the God that we worship is able to save us, but that's not enough because we know that God can do anything. Does anyone here doubt this is the moment to talk back to me like that kid when I was in middle school? This is the only time, no tasing, please. All right. Does anyone here think that God is not able to do anything? Stand up. No, we believe it. We believe that God can do anything, right? But then we need to also believe that God will save me that he will save me sometimes we know God can do it but he could do it for her but not for me 
Oh, yeah, I know that God can do anything, but man, I've, I've, that's not what happens to me. That's not what happens to my family. We have this like generational curse that nothing good ever happens to us. You see, it's not enough to believe that God has the ability to help you, that God has the ability to rescue you, that to deliver you, to save you. You must believe that he will do it. Even when it's tough, even when you don't see a way out, that he will do it. I expect you to save me, God. I'm going to stand up for you. I'm going to walk into the fire. I'm not going to give in. And I expect you to rescue me because you are able and I believe that. And check out Daniel chapter 3 verse 17. They said, and he will save us from your power, O king. Think about this. These guys are in their 30s. The entire nation is on their face, worshiping this gold statue. And these three outsiders are standing up and saying, you know what? If you want to burn us, fine. But we're not going to conform to the culture that's around us. Maybe you're going through the fire right now in your life. Maybe you're struggling with something. Maybe it's something that's been around you for a long time. Maybe it's something that just happened. Maybe your life is great, but let me tell you, the fires will come, the pressure will come, and the pain will come. Isaiah 43 says this. It says, when you go through deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not Consume you, for I am your God. That is God's promise for all of us today. That when we go through the fire, the flames won't consume us. Maybe the, your neighbor got consumed. Maybe Fulanita at the end of the corner got consumed. But me and my family, if the fire comes, let it come. Because I will not be consumed. I am not worried. I know that God can do it, and I am expecting him to do it. The second thing is that we announce our loyalty to God no matter what. We honor God. We respect God. We believe that he's going to save us. But if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. We're not going to give in. You see, and when we go through trials in our lives, sometimes God saves us from the crisis. Sometimes everyone else is going through something and we're spared. And we see that in the Bible time and time again. Sometimes God helps us avoid the fire. Sometimes God saves us through the crisis. Right, there's this crisis and God saves us. This week I went to pray for someone in the hospital, right, that had had a sprained ankle for like a month. It's going on a trip. It's like, this is getting worse. Goes to the emergency room, find out she has a blood clot in her leg and a blood clot in her lung and was about to get on a plane to go to California. So through the crisis of the sprained ankle, God used it to save her from getting on a plane and dying. And a doctor that doesn't believe in God, that isn't a Christian, said, hey, you must believe in God. Because if you wouldn't have come for your ankle, we wouldn't have found the, the blood clot in your lung. So you may be going through a crisis now, and I want you, before you leave here today, that you thank God God, I thank you for the crisis. Because as crazy as that sounds, I believe that you are God and that your will is going to be made perfect in my life. Right? Amen. And you see, that's the God that we serve. First Peter says this, it may be necessary for you to be sad for a while because of the many trials that you suffer. Their purpose is so your faith, which is much more precious than gold, must be tested so that it may endure. And then you will receive praise and glory and honor the day when Jesus is revealed. And the reason that we go through this in our life is because God is more interested in our character than in our comfort. I'm interested in my comfort. All right. I have friends inviting me to go camping. And this is my, my term. All right. And I'll tra try to translate it to English. And it's like, yo he comido bastante hueso, ahora es tiempo para jamón, right? That means I've eaten a lot of bone, and now it's time for the ham, right? You know, so it's like, I'll go camping, but I need to get, like, a Winnebago with a bed, and I need five pillows to sleep. I know it sounds crazy, but it just, that's just the way it works, and I got to pin myself, and ugh, that's how I fall asleep. So if you want to go camping and do s'mores, and I think that's awesome, 
Pero when you go pitch your tent, I'm going to go jump in my camper, right? So I'm interested in my comfort. But you know who doesn't care about my comfort? It's God. God cares about my character. So if he had to choose between my character and my comfort, he's like, you know what, Mark? I'm more, I'm more concerned about your character. Yeah, he wants me to be comfortable sometimes. But I think it's more important to be a person of character. And you're like, why is there so much sorrow? Why is there so much pain? If you guys haven't figured it out, this is in heaven, right? The Bible says that in heaven, there will be no more sadness. In heaven, there will be no more sorrow. There will be no more sickness. That's eternity. And so, yeah, the Christian life is awesome. And I think it's the best life that you can ever live. I studied religion in a secular college. And a, a professor that didn't believe in God taught us all the religions. And at the end of the class, he said, if any of you want to be happy, I don't believe that this is like your way to heaven. But if any of you want to be happy, statistics and scholars know that the happiest people are in the world are the ones that believe in Jesus. Think about that. So it's just practically no Holy Spirit, no, oh, no Tanya leading worship, none of that stuff. No worship overlooking Marlins Park, none of that. If you want to be happy, just do what the Bible says that Christians need to do. Be the husband of one woman, love your children, honor your father and your mother, don't lie, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not kill. I mean, you do those 10 things and you're going to live a pretty awesome life. But yeah, life is tough. And you're probably here today, Mark, that's awesome. But man, right now I'm, I'm struggling with something. I'm struggling with my mind. It's 2020. We're here. It's almost halfway through the month or a little over halfway through the month and nothing's changed. I feel like things are getting worse. All right. God loves you and God has great things in store for you. Verse 19, it says, Nebuchadnezzar became so furious, like I told you, his face distorted with rage. And he commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Why does he do that? Does he think that like these... Jews need a little more fire to burn up. He just wanted to make sure that these guys got incinerated. All right. He wanted to make sure that they were burned up, that there was no excuse. And then he goes even further and says, tie them up. Like you burn better when you're tied up. Right. So they tie them up. And then they get two strong soldiers to get them and throw them into the fire. And the fire is so hot that the guys that are throwing them in die. And so Shadrach, Meshach... And Abednego are thrown into the blazing fire. When you go through the fire, God's with you. God will never leave you and God will never forsake you. And look what happens in verse 24. It says, suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumps up in amazement and asks his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them in the furnace? Didn't we tie them up and I told you to tie them up real tight? Yes, we did. His advisor said, well, look now, he shouted, you can see four men now walking around freely in the fire, unharmed. And this fourth man looks like the son of the gods. That's incredible. I don't know about you, but I know I've never gone through a difficulty in my life that the son of God hasn't been there for me. All right. And that's exactly someone who didn't believe in. He's like, what the heck? Is that And like I told you, Jesus said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And God is not a liar. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. The last words pretty much that Jesus said at the Great Commission before he ascended into heaven, he said this. Jesus said, I will always be with you to the very end of the age. I will be with you. And when you go through the fire, you know what also happens sometimes? Is that everything that's tying you down, it burns off too. We saw that we're walking freely and so God was in the fire with them and so God will be in the fire with you. And sometimes we go through the fire and we have baggage. We have stuff, crap that we carry with us. But you know what? When they pulled them out, they were pulled out unharmed, unsinged. Not a single hair on their head was burned. The only thing they didn't have was the things that were tying them down. What is tying you down now? What is that thing that you're struggling with? That pain that you have? Sometimes we need the fire to burn it off. Because after you come out of the fire, you're not the same woman anymore. You're not the same man anymore. All of a sudden, all the stuff, the weight that was holding you down, you're now free. God gives you new freedom. And God will make sure that you come out unharmed. And here's what happens at the end of the story. Then Nebuchadnezzar came close as he could 
to the furnace, to the flaming furnace, and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Who's he worshiping now? Come out. Come out at once. So these three men stepped out of the fire. Then the princes and the prefects and the governors and the advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not even touched them. They didn't even smell like smoke. They didn't even smell like they were even in there. See, if I trust God when the heat is on, I will show faith in the fire. Man, show faith in that trial that you're probably in right now, in that pain that you're in right now. And the most amazing thing that happens when we're faithful in the fire is that it brings unbelievers to God. The best testimony that you can give, who's praying for somebody right now that doesn't know God? I know a lot of you, you write it on the back of your connect cards and I pray, my wife prays, the leaders pray. The best thing that you can ever do is be faithful to God in the fire. Be faithful to God in the trials. And people will be like, oh my gosh, how did you have so much faith? I want some of that. And so when they come out of the fire in Daniel chapter 3, it says, Then the king said praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel to rescue his servants. They trusted him. They trusted in the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they didn't compromise. And so today we're going to pray for your friends, those of you that raise your hand, that don't know Jesus. And we're going to pray that not only that they find God, but that God uses me and God uses you, uses our testimony to bring them to the knowledge of Christ. You see, we're going to come through the fire unharmed. If you're here today, I'm going to invite the band to come back up. If you're here today and you're going through a trial, maybe it's something you've been dealing with for a while. Maybe it's someone in your family that's struggling with something. And, and when our family's hurting, you know what happens? We hurt too. When our brother, our sister, our friend, they're going through a difficulty, it weighs us down. When there's problems in our home, it weighs us down. Man, sometimes if it's even a neighbor, someone who's not even blood, they're going through something and it weighs us down. I believe that God has put you in the very place that you are so that you can shine bright for him regardless of the situation that you're in. That you would live for God in every moment of your life. But you know what? Before you can decide to live for God and live at the level that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lived, we need to decide what are we willing to give our life for? What are you willing to give your life for? If the moment did come where it was taken that your faith, you had to decide, am I going to follow God or lose my life? You know, there's people that are martyrs, and we, I preached about that a couple of uh, months ago. People that die almost every day for their faith in God. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Boom. Heads chopped off. Craziest thing ever. Would I be brave enough to do that? Like gunshot to the head if I believe that? That's kind of scary. I, I think I would. I believe that I would. You know, the other question is, as a Christian, as a follower of God, God expects us to live in certain ways to honor him and honor our family. Are you willing to die for your spouse, for your children? I'm not saying, of course, you jump in front of a moving car to protect your wife and your kids, but sometimes dying isn't just physically dying. Dying sometimes is dying to some of the things that you want, some of the things that you do, some of the things that you say, the way that you act. It's probably easier to jump in front of a moving car than to change some of your habits. Be like, bro, I'll jump off this building right now, but don't take that from me, right? What is the fiery furnace? Every time I'm with her, I just do things. I think things I shouldn't do. It pulls me away from God. I, I don't want to pray. I don't want to go to church because I feel guilty when I do this, when I say that, when I look at this, when I go to that place. And you know what? It's okay. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm just trying to collectively let's identify what that thing is because we all do it. And it's not your fault that you lean towards that because you were created to worship and all you need to do is move that God out of the way, focus 100% on Jesus and start doing what you were created to do to the one you were created to worship. And then you're going to start looking like God. You're going to start loving like God. You're going to start caring like God. And then it's not like, oh, Pe Pepito or Juanita or Jose, Maria, Carrie, Jude, or I don't know what other names. It's not, it's not me. It's God. 
I'm not that good. I'm not that nice, but it's God that lives in me. Amen. Has anybody been freaking out about the fires? Right? Um, excuse me. My kids used to do that after they drank, and I thought it was super cute that they would go, ah, right? Um, I was kind of obsessing about these fires. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's pretty crazy. Like, you know, California, you got Australia's on fire, all these koalas dying, the cutest animals in the world. I think they're like in the billions, you know, and of animals. They're probably counting insects and stuff. And, um, and then I heard about this tree, right? It's actually the largest tree ever, the largest living organism, which are the redwoods, right? And a redwood seed is inside of this pine cone that the only way for it to actually like fall in Germany and grow is if it reaches extreme temperatures, temperatures of fire. Think about that. That's why it's so dangerous. The redwood forests don't cut them down because the only way for this pine cone and then there's this other pine tree up in um, New England somewhere. I wrote it down somewhere, scribbled it into my notes somewhere in here. The Jack Forest tree. Only way, 100%. Because the resin in this pine cone is so hard that it takes a fire for the tree to grow. And so if you're in the fire today, it's because God wants to do incredible things in and through your life. I'm going to invite you to stand up. And I know what happens sometimes. We get mad. I get mad when I go through trials, when I lose something, when things break or when a relationship goes south, we get upset and it haunts us. The pain drives us crazy. The waiting. There's so much just agony and frustration in the waiting. Like, when is this person going to change? When is my situation going to change? But could it be that one, we just need to finish this test because God has something better for us. And I want to remind you, maybe it's breaking the relationship, quitting the job, changing your career, moving, whatever it may be. Maybe it's a drastic, like, guillotine type of change that you need to do for the blessing to come. And you're blocking God's blessing. There's some of you that the blessings are right there. It's ready to fall on you, and it doesn't come because you are literally blocking it. You're blocking it. But then could it be that we just need to be faithful? in the midst of the fire and wait for that seed to pop out so that the best thing that could ever happen in our life, this beautiful tree, this beautiful forest can be populated with prosperity and joy and happiness and peace. And not just for you, because you know what? As crazy as this sounds, we got 40, 50 years left maybe, but then what? Yeah, we're going to live for eternity, but our kids and our kids' kids, could God use you to change the trajectory of your future and your legacy? Maybe you are here today reaping the bad harvest that your grandparents and your great-grandparents sowed, and, and here you are, but God can use you to cut that tree and plant a brand new tree that is completely different and blessed. Amen? And so as we pray, if you're here today, and what we're going to do is we're all going to come before God and offer up our idols. All right? We're going to say, God, this is the thing. These are the things. And we're going to come and pray. Tanya's going to sing Waymaker, Miracle Maker, I think. And uh, he does great things. But man, let's just offer that up to God. And I want to tell you, I want to pray for every single one of you. You write it on your connect cards. You email me, Mark, at Godless Miami, whatever it is, 21 days fasting. We're going to be doing a liquid fast for most of it in my house. Stella's fasting from French fries, which is pretty awesome for an eight-year-old kid. No French fries. That's pretty tough. Rodney, that'd probably be impossible for you, right? <laughs> um, but we're all sacrificing something physical. Um, because we're believing for a breakthrough. I'm believing for a lot of you that God's going to change your life. In three weeks, everything's going to be completely different. 
Amen. Do you believe that? So Tanya, lead us. I'm going to come down and we're going to pray and we're, I'm going to offer up a couple little gods that I have. And, and uh, so I'm not better than any of you. And, and let's just say, God, my pride, my arrogance, my vices, whatever it may be, my children, my wife, my husband, God is going to be my God and I'm going to love everybody else. All right. So let's worship and let's offer up our idols.